right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is John. I am a professor at the University of Michigan teach digital studies as well as American culture. So this talk is going to have a kind of American studies bent to it. So I hope we're all good. Uh, the other thing, and the press told me to do this, is I have to do the publicity for the book. A lot of the stuff that I am talking about now are comments and thoughts and problems I've been thinking through after the book's publication, but a lot of them germinate from the actual book's text. So if you're interested in it, buy it. If you want a free copy, maybe you can figure it out. Um, yeah, really? Oh, cool. Um, I love the cover. The cover in real life, if this is the reason to buy the book. You can buy text, whatever, that's easy. But it's really shiny. It's almost kind of insanely um, just splendid. So, okay. So the thing that is on the docket for me is I'm trying to talk about this idea called Zunzinil, which is a Cuban Spanish word for a hummingbird's tweet. And if you know anything about kind of geopolitical superiority in terms of data, this is actually also the name of a social networking site that USAID, the universe, uh, United States Agency for National Development, created in order to create what they said was a Cuban Twitter or a Cuban spring through this Cuban Twitter. So they're trying to actually topple the Castro regime through data and data alone. Um, at its height from 2010, it was 2012, it had its height about 40,000 users on it, and they were normally kind of doing apolitical stuff, but in the background, there was a notion that there was politics behind it. And so what the researchers at the USAID, who was actually a contracted group of undergraduates at uh, Costa Rican University did, is they algorithmically went through all of the messages and tried to figure out if users are pro-revolution, apolitical, or anti-revolutionary. And obviously this has a very narrow version of what is the political spectrum of Cuba, but it was structurally a reduction of Cuba's political body politic to a very, again, yeah, narrow three-dimensional um, perspective. It was a weird, are you, against, are you with us, or are you against us, or do you not care? That was, I guess, how we can kind of colloquially understand this. But what I want to do is take this immediate notion of pro-revolution, apolitical, and anti-revolutionary, and think through these neocolonial cl uh, classifications as a data-based political formation. So it's more structurally, this formation then is one that's alien to what we traditionally understand as individual or collective subjective experience. These historical notions of how we think through collectivity and individuality, especially through the body politic, is well represented in this wood carving from a guy named Abraham Bosse who did the etching for Thomas Hobbes Leviathan. Um, we see in this rendering itself a coat made of people. So the idea of a body politic was literally the body of the population constituting the population of England, France, America, whatever. But it relied on this kind of one-to-many homogeneity of like a individual is X and the body politic is X times whatever the population of the place is. Uh, largely though, then we can think of the individual and the body, especially as the last mile of subjective relationships. That the state responds to power and if throw, like throws power out there, but the locus of that power and the recipient is eventually an individual body, often with a name or at least with some sort of unique index of who they were. So I'm going to ask, what happens when the body is not the last mile? And what happens then when the body is then a medium instead of the end point? by which power interprets and authors epistemological claims about the body without directly querying the body. So for Cubans who use Zunzenil, they were obviously not asked, what do you think about the Castro regime, or what do you think about life on the island? They were merely just interpreted as they were. It was not, it was not their identity nor their selves, but rather an identification of who they were through some foreign power. So, Normally, we think of embodiment as extraordinarily important, and I completely side with this uh, in feminist studies and feminist theory, as well as digital studies. The idea of embodiment disallows us from being entirely just virtual, saying, okay, it's the world out there. And it also allows us to think of the material relationships that make people who they are, the contextual localities that make people who they are, as well as it disallows a universal subject, which is in liberal political theory, a la hab, something that is the contingent kind of idea, that these are all equal beings, although they're all men and landowning and um, ostensibly straight and wealthy. So, um, 
This also, though, if we think about the individual body as being the endpoint of power, presupposes that power cares about individual bodies. And this is not to be flippant, but I, I think of when we have data being this kind of determining force now in 21st century politics, is it the specificity of a new user that's important, or is it the pattern? Is it the individual with all their authorship of who they are, or is it how they fit within the population and the onus of how that population can then serve as an administrative role or regulatory role on behalf of the state. So again, concerning data, body is a medium rather than an endpoint to processes of subjectivity. The people I'm looking to and also in concert with, but also I don't want to necessarily bog down too deeply into a lot of the algorithmic regulation literature or theories of how algorithms and users affect each other. Um, the thing that I would suggest, though, is most of these, these texts, though, do rely on an individual user. They rely on some sort of endpoint of something that is identifiable, stable, nameable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Except maybe the Deleuzian piece who thinks of the subject of power as an individual instead of an individual. So there's some sort of la la layer there that we could think through. But what I'm going to suggest is rather than making a huge intervention, I'm just going to pose a problem, which is what, what happens if the body is not the endpoint? What happens if the individual no longer has that kind of stature that they had during Leviathan or they had in liberal political theory. So first, this formation of a database body politic is where self-organization and volition plays little to no role. Individuals' performance, a la performance theory of Judith Butler's gender theory, or kind of really anything, often has to cycle back to the subject. It has to be reflexive to something in order for somebody to be ostensibly disciplined towards some normal accord. Uh, what's happening rather now is that people are being interpreted based on performance, but they're not being told how the interpretation directly affects them, or it doesn't create an identity about that person because they perform in a comparable way. Rather, we're existing in a kind of Amazonian, you might be like this person because you did this, or Netflix-like clustering pattern recognition thing. So it's not about you, it's you are as if somebody else. So it kind of denounces the singular, but it allows for multiplicity of meanings and the multiplicity of political subjectivities. So, by my, and, but rather than merely kind of suggesting products in the Amazonian sense, or maybe suggesting social relations in the Facebook sense, uh, these clustering algorithms constitute political blocks or segments of the body politic that then lead to control as well as definition of the body politic itself. And so the two interventions, or again, proposals is the word I use, that I'm gonna make is one, that we should move from liberal post combahee identity politics. This is in reference to the Combahee River Collective, um, and it's to say that I'm completely an acolyte and a follower of that theory from the 1970s, and I think that contemporary identity politics is dealing with a lot of the fissures of what that means in the neoliberal order. Um, but we can think about how we move from identity politics to what we maybe could call an identification politics. So following my initial work on what we could think of as algorithmic identity, or soft power politics, uh, we see that identification, often rather than identity itself, has become the dominant mode by which users or populations are ordered and understood and administrated by a state and capitalist perspectives. So often, who you are doesn't matter, it's who you are seen to be matters ent entirely. And then two, when we treat individuals as ontologically equivalent to populations, social ideas become anthropo analytically anthropomorphized. It's a weird sentence, but what I mean by that is if we think of Leviathan or we think of transhumanism and futurology stuff that's trying to say, you know, we can live forever or we can upload our brains to a computer, um, what happens if the human is the same as the world, which is the same as a digital computer, it does this weird a priori thing. So in Catherine Hale's book, uh, My Mother's Computer, she actually jokes and says, thank, talking about this theory, which is called digital philosophy, it's like, thank goodness we invented the digital computer in order to understand what the world is. So it's a weird uh, kind of who, what, what came first notion. But what I suggest is that, um, where am I on my notes? that when we think of individuals as being the same as the population, we're allowing this ontology then of ones and zeros. We're allowing the body to be made of ones and zeros in terms of protons, electrons, and thus we're allowing the population to be of that same vocabulary or grammar of being. In this way then, we're not anthropomorphized into a digital form, is we're anthropomorphized from a digital form. And thus, if we say everything from the ground up is digital, what we do is we allow consciousness and the body to be a one and a zero, and thus it allows us to build into that gender is now ones and zeros, race is now ones and zeros, citizenship is now ones and zeros, and the body politic at large is ones and zeros. A way to understand this 
idea and might why it may be problematic is to think through what I call proto-categorical intersectionality, which actually comes from a Twitter study by these machine learning researchers, and this is totally serious, they just read Judith Butler, and they're just like, wow, there's more than two genders in the world, and so how do we actually go about and learn through this in terms of algorithmic logics? And so they said, normally in terms of gender, what we would do is we separate populations into men and women, and then we would follow the patterns that define man and woman, and you have a supervised learning process. They're like, what if we did an uncluster, unsupervised model, and then just found clusters, and that's what they did, and they found then 20 different versions of what they thought of as gender, but you look into it, it has extraordinarily racialized, sexed, aged, class-based assessments, that you, what you're doing is you're actually finding intersectional categories in an empirical sense that have no relation at all to questions of patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism at large. So rather, these asymmetries pass through bodies and then into their data in order to become processed by algorithms. Um, of course, this has always been the case that data has made populations, um, Foucault, Ian Hacking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This argument is very, very long and storied. Um, and more, I just want to add on to it and maybe think about what happens when we move it into a 21st version, 21st century version of this argument, which is that when you make a population, often that assumes that you datafy or quantify that population, because when you make it, then you can administer it, then you can govern it, then you can organize it according to how the power who defines the population understands what their ideas are. Um, the way I'm going to go through this shift into the 21st century comes from three quotations. This first is from Lisa Nakamura, who writes that surveillance is a signifying system, uh, system that produces a social body rather than straightforwardly reflects it. I'm very compelled by this. She's talking especially about actual physical bodies as well as she's talking about racialized or racialization in general. Um, I would suggest that we can also take this and think it's the political body politic as much as it's the actual corporeal body that surveillance also produces. Um, and this leads us to the idea of the body politic that Haraway recalls in the critique of what she calls corporeal fetishism, wherein when we, I guess, omit or avoid the realities of our lived experience, fetishistic interpretations then produce a body not as embodied, but as a medium for the generation of static knowledges. Fetishizing the body means it's no longer your body, but a representation that then is either proprietary or secret or something that is not authored or even co-authored by who you are. And lastly, this omission of lived realities follows Me uh, Lev Manovic's concept of transcoding, which we can think of generally as just the move from like, an actual waveform to an MP3 or to other digital formats. But what he thinks of is how culture shaves off its complexity in order for it to be computational. This quotation talks about how the ontology of the computer is put into culture, and I would think that then if we understand the ontology of social life being ones and zeros in this theory, that it's never going to really square with lived experience, and so what it does is it narrows what culture can be, it narrows what society can be in general. Um, a way to understand this, so an example, is I was doing actual press for the book, so another plug for the book, and I was on a radio in Kansas City, and somebody called in, and they said, this is all well and good and interesting, but I actually was denied the right to vote because of my cell phone data. Interesting. So he sent me all this information. We're going to call him John Doe. And it turns out in 2014, his cell phone was seen to be pinging towers that were not at all near where he actually lived from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., but were pinging towers in Southern California, Kansas City, Missouri. He was in a place called Overland Park, Kansas. Um, the district attorney, uh, attorney investigators found that, quote, the analysis of John Doe's cell phone usage indicates that he does not make a material number of telephone calls from his stated residential address in Overland Park. But then I would have to ask, who is he or his in this statement? In this example, John Doe's body is allegedly present, but since the government's decision is based on metadata alone, it matters little, if at all, that this data is connected directly to John Doe's body. In this way, then, bodies are fungible precisely because they are not expected to fill in that last mile between power and subject. Um, this is also a comparable move that we see in the Obama administration's drone program where they moved from targeted strikes that would require an actual person being identified on the ground by an intelligence agent or by a lot of different calibrating factors to now it's a signature strike which determines if or if not somebody is a terrorist based on their cell phone data or where their GPS is. Um, at the first data power conference, I actually talked about this in terms of what the NSA does in terms of algorithmic citizenship. So thinking through how the NSA uses metadata to determine if somebody's a citizen or a foreigner. Uh, 
the population in this case then becomes explicitly transcoded where the body of a citizen or a foreigner or a medium in and of itself, because an algorithmic citizen allegedly connected to a body, produces data then that actually fits or frustrates the algorithm. It's not the body, but the data that is in conferred citizenship. Um, this medium then becomes a channel between the state and data so that the individual or the body itself as an embodied person is not an expressive en entity. It has no ability to speak or to you know, voice oneself. It's rather having to voice itself through this weird syllogism of subject to citizen to individual to person to IP address or to MAC address. Um, in this relationship, we see then the transcoding of populations into subcategories that, again, I mentioned is, is a soft biopolitics, but it's a biopolitical rep a relationship that's different than Foucauldian motions. Um, and because of this, I invite, I invite us to consider the political opportunities and complications that emerge when a body politic is authored by power and with no direct participation or re direct reflexivity from one's political community, wherein then racial, class, gender solidarities can never actually be made in real time because nobody knows what race, gender, class means in this algorithmic form. This datafied body politic then realigns body, uh, biopolitics' own definition so that while biopolitics is no longer just the power over life, it becomes the power over data, which has become the new index for life itself. And then lastly, we can see what are the pros and cons of this new body politic, not even new, but this kind of datafied body politic. And I would say that there's three that are often overlapping and completely incomplete, and so I'd invite us to think through it or critique it collectively. The first is that this relationship to the body politic that doesn't use the body as the last mile, but uses it as a medium to get to the data, which is the last mile, um, provides a distance from the subject. This distance then allows experiences with power that are flexible instead of absolute, or more flexible than absolute. Um, it allows for loose definitions of the self, wherein citizenship is not a passport, but a pattern. Um, but neg in the negative form, you can never be too sure what the regulatory fortitude of these uh, algorithmic assessments are. You can never really be sure what the implications are when you're made a citizen or made a foreigner. Secondly, a queer's categorization um, in the sense that the ontology of the self is different than the ontology of the other. I understand history and subjective experience in a very non-digital way, but the way the algorithms understand it is in a very pattern-assessed, database way. So when this the schism between the two, you have this freedom that allows for personal identity to be created as one wants. Uh, the problem, though, is that the identifications are proprietary and secret. They're not really able to be assessed or critiqued directly. They have to be then felt or maybe potentially inferred. And lastly, when we think of bodies as mediums, not endpoints, we have to think of the malleability and temporality of personal or collective identity, which if we go back to the 1980s and 1970s, that was the project of cultural theorists, is they didn't want identity to happen. They didn't think that these boxes that people would put into were actually helpful. Um, so when we have this idea of a medium, that it doesn't really matter who we are. So that's a good thing as well as a bad thing, precisely because there's no ability to identify collectively. There's no ability to find we are both identified in this way, so let's bound together, create some politics that has collectivity at its base. Rather, we're all kind of as if each other, or we're all kind of within this pattern with no real there there that we can point to that might be problematic. And so to go back to the Kambahi River Collective, it actually takes away the let's say the ferocity or the teeth of that theorization, precisely because their theorization of identity politics that people are affected by power according to that identity, but that no longer applies when people do not reflexively understand the identity or can understand others being inculcated in the same power relationship. So, thank you. Um, I'm also uh, invested in um, the ideas around adapting and um, adapting uh, to embodied technology <laughs> scenarios. Okay, so datafied bodies, critical approaches to body area networks. What will the next generation of datafied bodies look like? Today, the idea of wearing a Fitbit or an Apple Watch for numerical self-monitoring or quantified self has become a popular social practice. The use of personal health and medical devices is much more prevalent than a decade ago. But digital devices allow people to readily monitor biofeedback through heart sensors, capture and share representations of memory through, say, GoPro cameras, monitor health conditions like glucose levels, um, meet people, Tinder, protect each other, wear safe apps, track levels of fitness, as I said. Known well to this crowd, in cybercapitalism, these devices help algorithms to make decisions for us. 
filter what we read, what we buy, consider buying, map our whereabouts, remember faces of people we know. Digital life evolves as technology colonizes the body, and the body is goaded to become more digital and more datified quite systematically. In a collection edited by um, Luciano Floridi, Murray Hildebrand defines datification as, and I quote, the process of translating the flux of life into discrete, machine-readable data points. So the popularity and indeed corollary commercial successes of being online have led to the idea that people could do much more to augment the body for ambitious ends. And this is where I think you get into transhumanist rhetoric. What could, what could happen next? Let us consider um, the idea of remote patient monitoring for disease control, a concept under discussion that leads to dramatic um, claims that emerging technologies, network culture ubiquity, processes of datification will revolutionize healthcare someday and ultimately everyday life. But in, really, in order to meet such a scenario to its fullest, brain, heart, skin, motion, and other forms of internal body sensors would need to track biofeedback data continuously. To revolutionize personal health, collection, data collection would need to be of great volume and, intent, and velocity. And connectivity would be paramount concern because data would be sent to remote services, servers to be interpreted more ambitious personal data infrastructures would be required. Um, in this scenario I'm discussing, algorithmic decisions then would interpret life signs, read the flux of life directly from inside the body. In order, again, in order to meet these kinds of ambitious or even utopian commercial goals, new internet standards are, are actually evolving, and this, this idea fascinated me. Wireless body area networks, or simply body area networks, are networks of wireless sensors that can be sewn into clothing, placed directly on the skin, ingested, or implanted into the body. And the point is a body network for controlled data flows. While medical applications dominate so much of this um, discussion and indeed speculation, lifestyle and entertainment applications are really included in this conversation, and military apps uh, linger in the discourse. The kind of body area network requires that the topos of the body and its internal processes are suitably networked to connect with external digital structures. But right now, the conversation and the discourse involves largely neutral descriptions of tech advancements and proposed apps. Um, however, interpreted, if we interpret this as speculation rather than advancement, these ap applications stand to augment multiple spheres of life. They contribute to the rise of the Internet of People, the IOP, um, which is long a speculative idea, but one that is now regularly discussed at engineering conferences. And it's something I think that we really need to discuss um, in forums like this. So this paper attends to a historical moment in uh, Internet infrastructure development in order to really turn a critical eye on this benchmark in digital embodiment. It uses a 2012 vote to approve a Wi-Fi standard for body area networks um, by the IEEE Internet Working Group, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, this international organization that passes internet standards. And it makes a claim that as we imagine a network datafied body of the future, we need to consider the potential data harm and other societal concerns along with the technical issues that we're really now talking about mostly. Who will be advantage or disadvantage? If big data collection is made efficient with a, a implanted bands and implanted sensors, will citizens be afforded the ability to block, control, opt in and out of big data applications, or will it be involuntary? My talk um, is part of work in progress for a book project um, that I'm working on with Andrew Iliadis. We have a book proposal under review at the moment. and. This is really a case study on a case study, so it's new research to an extent. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the background, the methods, and some of the uh, critical directions I want to go in with this. So this is really about evolving the Bluetooth standard. Um, the IEEE 802 is an international organization that develops standards for wireless communication. The key focus for the 802.15.6 is the band standard for a short range, low power, and highly reliable wireless communication for use in close proximity to or inside a human or non-human body, by the way. The band standard forms part of the PAN 
um, personal, personal area network standards, which include the original Bluetooth. Bluetooth has been deemed insufficient for the needs of the human body as a host for this network. Um, I find it fascinating. We talked about stories this morning in the keynote. What are the stories behind um, some of these some some of these types of innovation? Arthur Art Astrin, 1945 to 2006, is one of the pioneer, pioneering architects of Wi-Fi. He led this task group, the BAN task group, that finally approved the standard for body area networks, which was published in 2013 after a five-year consultation process. Interestingly, Astrin gained his expertise um, when he worked at Apple Computer, IBM, Siemens, Memorex, and Citicor. And some say Astrin, Astrin birthed Wi-Fi. But practical reasons for the standard are that it would be more, more secure, physically safer, there would be less radiation around the body, and less vulnerable to cyber threat. The demand for bands is a response um, from the past decade for more sophisticated and safer kinds of connectivity for personal data capture. Currently in the design stages, bands will enable powerful convergences among technologies by providing a single unified solution, like a f single unified con solution for connectivity. But at this, at this stage, I think we need to look ahead to consider the types of data infra infrastructures that are being assumed for us, the standards that are proposed for us, the need for policy um, that isn't really being written, and the potential for data harm as they become part of as these bands really become part of mass data, data assemblages. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the theory, uh, the text collection, and some of the discourse analysis um, I'm working on. In terms of, uh, right now I'm really influenced by Gavin Smith's recent article, Surveillance, Data, and Embodiment, on the work of being watched. In it, he proposes a useful revision of Mark Andreevich's work to form a vocabulary on data profiling invol involving surveillance and the body. And he writes, two concepts emerge that elucidate the embodiment surveillance, surveillance nexus and specifically the way in which the body functions dialectically as both a producer and recipient of data. I advance the notions disembodied exhaust and embodied exhaustion to conceptualize the body as a border site where data are simultaneously emitted and leveraged when coming to terms with data valence, he discusses sensors, sensor devices, quote, in terms of their developing mass surveillance dragnets and a profusion of data flows. I think that's an apt terminology for, for a body area network as it's being um, conceptualized right now. In order to deal with this phenomena, I look at, I'm really only looking at two sets of, sets of text. We searched for and collected 1,200 articles from the ACM library, the Association of Computing Machinery, under very basic um, search terms, body area network, um, w, w bands, and they're dated from 2001 to 2017. So at large uh, international ac academic technology conferences, these, they've always privileged technical novelty first and socio-ethical goals as an implied consideration sort of after the fact if at all, or the emphasis falls on the first most urgent and legitimate need, um, which I can understand, saving lives, curing illness, protecting humans from physical harm without a contextualized vision for future outcomes in many other myriad socio-ethical socio spheres. So unintended um, outcomes are, are not discussed in these forums. But the second collection is comprised of the actual working group drafts um, that led up to the vote and the final published version. So these are the exchanges of notes, emails, and marked up text that led to the standard. And that this kind of um, back and forth fascinates me, but I've pulled some interesting quotes. So one, in this, in, if the goal is for standard inoperability that will eventually converge bodies with internet, internet of things, internet of people, and private corporate network infrastructures, such as um, insurance companies and entertainment multinationals, the standard is still, at this stage, a justification. So one of them is a quote, the ban market potential is hundreds of millions of devices. So to me, it's interesting that this working group sees it itself as pioneering the next, um, the, the datafied body of the future. Another quote is, by establishing a globally harmonized standard, the target user base will be as large as indicated by the growing demand for wireless connectivity in almost all devices. 
Um, and finally, it cites the people who care about this. International wireless industry leaders, academic researchers, semiconductor manufacturers, system integrators, and end users. So in addition to these parties, um, I think we need to look at other things, design motivations, and how they're also linked with the personal bias of expert inventors who are actually advancing the standard and eventually will create the technology. We need to look at those who invent technologies that we eventually adopt, um, that populations, governments, and corporations embrace. So I started with um, Art Astrin, and I think it's interesting to come back to him. In the year before his death, Astrin is interviewed by the Computer History Museum, and he describes the slow-moving process to pass the standard. Discussing his own personal goals for bands, um, he, he, as he served as the IEEE he served as the IEEE chair from the start, but while this was happening, he was fighting an invasive form of cancer himself since 2003. And as I said, he died in 2016. And he expressed that he was personally influenced originally by Ray Kurzweil's 2006, The Singularity is Near. And in this talk, he talks about how he, he, wanted, he was interested in the idea of little robots going around inside the body. And it's fascinating that someone with this kind of knowledge um, in Wi-Fi wanted to make it happen, right? He decided to bring this group together for that purpose. Naming specific diseases which might be alleviated by such a real-world technology, Astrin's goal is to better the health and longevity of human subjects. So there's that transhumanist rhetoric. But he also mentions the fact that mar large multinationals were also at the table with him, altering choices at the early stages for the standard. He also points out that cyber threats are a key concern, even for him, who is making the standard to try to prevent them. Um, for example, denial of service attacks really could cause fatalities um, in this particular technology if they weren't controlled. The momentum for a ban is driven by medical need and indeed transhuman goals to overcome biological determinism. From the mouth of a dying man, the need for bans really seems a worthy goal. But the idea of infiltrating the material body in these transformative ways is also driven by profit-hungry players who we all know very well. Here are some examples, I think, of ways that they would use a ban or would need a ban. Intel wants brain implants in its customers' heads by 2020. Researchers expect, expect brainwaves to operate computers, TVs, and cell phones. So Intel. Um, recently, Zuckerberg says, one day I believe we'll be able to send full rich thoughts to each other directly using technology. And much more recently, Elon Musk launches Neuralink to connect brains with computers. Startup from CEO of Tesla and SpaceX aims to implant tiny electrodes in human brains. So, um, these kinds of rhetorical claims join the broader context of the past decade. The lure of smart cities, big data infrastructures, and kinds of embodied integration have prompted this desire for better network capabilities to make these visions happen. And it's these sorts of predictions. Um, if these sorts of predictions are to occur, one piece in the puzzle is suitable connectivity. So I think speculation needs to be part of um, our conversations as well. Device development is rarely fully or thoroughly challenged at the design stage for its social implications. It's really only held accountable once social outcomes, unintended or otherwise, impact citizens. Wrapped up in discourses of neoliberal globalization, technical adaptation, participation and celebration, ethical goals are overshadowed at the design stage. In earlier work, I talked about the continuum of embodiment as a framework to explore the ideological justification for technology hardware platforms that are increasingly embodied, um, and ones that host mass social media platforms in Gillespie's, Gillespie's terms. Exploring the phenomenon as a continuum enabled me to write about how public, academic, and commercialized discourses valorize pre-release personal technology on a continuum, linking mobile to implant, wearable to implantable and embeddable as a necessary and imminent future. Momentum forged in public discourses or even through extreme spectacles of wealth, society is exposed to celebrate um, how mobile technology evolves to become wearable and a process that would lend, then lay the groundwork and expectations for implantable tech. I'm thinking of Google's Sergey Brin announcing glass with skydivers, Tim Cook revealing Apple Watch at these massive hyped events, and indeed Elon Musk um, glorifying the announcement to develop brain implants. 
The spectacle of Silicon Valley wealth obfuscates challenge to make an already hailed public assume the outcome long before the reality of its development is even possible. Transhuman ideology makes the proposition hard to ignore. I was struck by this conference's query in the call, while living in regimes of data power, is it possible to regain agency and mobilize data for a common good? If datafication currently involves using devices, networks, and sensors to track human behaviors and responses, monitor them, store them, control them using algorithms in order to orient and nudge people in a desired direction, how do we, re how do we respond to plans to afford data even greater agency with our biological processes when networks get inside the body. Um, I was going to, Gavin Smith um, talks about this as a task for body study scholars to analyze in finer detail the embodiment datafication affective nexus. Uh, this involves exploring the subjective experiences and social impacts of bodily materials, feelings, and behaviors being rendered into networkable data flows and the political, economic, and cultural factors underpinning this process. And Bands are not yet a constitutive apparatus for big data, but they very well may be in the near future. And I think we need to consider a world when band-enabled sensors are as everyday as Bluetooth earbuds. Thank you. So uh, my talk will be on the um, alienation of digital identities. And uh, just some quick information about myself. I'm a media studies uh, student at Pratt Institute in New York. Uh, before this, I worked as a software engineer. Um, and, okay, cool, thank you. Uh, and currently, my research is focused on the intersection between um, user data and blockchain technology. So, like many of you, my life is pretty much mediated you know, through technology. I buy food from online delivery apps. I buy all my um, daily items through Amazon. Keep in contact with friends through Facebook. I speak with potential suitors on Match.com. You know, I find jobs through LinkedIn. I travel via Wikipedia. I receive paychecks you know, through my online e-banking. However, I have no control over who, when, and how this information is used. My access to them is at the mercy of these companies. And if all of these services decided to shut me off, I will basically become invisible to my friends and those around me, as well as to society at large. And I think that a big part of my physical identity as well as the digital, will be gone. So what do I mean when I talk about digital identity? I define digital identity loosely as all the data that are derived from a physical being which exists on these platforms. Additionally, it's not just the information which is captured, stored, but as well as derived from all of this data through machine learning, big data analysis, etc. And then what do I mean when I talk about alienation? And what is alienation? When I think of alienation, it really, for me, defines a state of being, where something which belongs to me are no longer controlled by me. And although this work is heavily inspired by Karl Marx uh, and his concepts around alienation, I have really defined it separately in three different ways. The first concept around, resolves around um, technical alienation, which is focused on centralized external storage of digital identities in company servers. Because, as you know, all of our information are stored in centralized server farms that exist outside of our control. So if there was any time that we don't want somebody to have access to this information, we really don't have a choice. You can't just pull the plug. And in my opinion, if you don't have control over something, you really don't have ownership either. So technically, we're all just renting our digital identities online. The second part 
revolves around value alienation. As we know, a lot of value is generated through our digital profiles, but as users, we reap none of this. But I think more importantly, there's actually a concept of the value of what the digital identities itself. So just like the way we can measure a person's capital value through their net worth, we can also measure the value of digital identities. And these are broken down into various layers, and I'll be happy to go into them uh, later if somebody's interested. But what is interesting about all of this is that one day the value of our digital identities could be worth more than the physical person. In another way, the digital version, so the digital copy, could be worth more than the physical version. And the way I think about it is, imagine the replica of the Mona Lisa is worth more than the original. And lastly, oh, can, can everyone see my face on the right or no? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. Don't want you guys to miss my face. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we need somebody then. <laughs> no, okay. So the, the last part um, of the alienation that I'm talking about is the alienation of the rights, which in my opinion is really the legitimization and the enforcement of the first two types of alienation by the legal system. An example would be you can delete your Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Match.com account, but you really don't have any legal jurisdiction over these platforms if they don't. You can't go to court, you can't sue them, and they're protected by the legal system. And although this topic is somewhat blurry, um, the, the idea of digital rights have been debated quite broadly in the legal system over the past decade. So now, why is all of this important? I believe that as more of our physical selves become digital, our online identities will play an ever more critical role in our physical existence. For instance, we have seen that uh, Amazon have opened up these new supermarkets, and the only way to enter is if you have an Amazon account. You can't enter these supermarkets if you don't. And I think in the future, it's very likely that we won't be able to travel outside of our apartments if we don't have our digital identity. And I think that without the control and ownership of this information, we really don't have control and ownership of our lives. So what am I proposing to solve this problem? I believe that what we need to do is to reclaim our digital identities. Because I believe that the inability for users to own and store their digital identities is the root causes of alienation. And I think that to solve this problem, what we must do is to return the access and control of centralized databases back to the users, to re redistribute this back to the users, just like the way the internet was meant to be. The idea is that we can use existing solutions such as blockchain and decentralized storage and store publicly ac accessible user information such as images, text files, large files, videos, anything that the public can have access to and put these in a decentralized file storage, a decentralized Dropbox, if you like to think. And the idea is that the user will have unique access to this information. And the thing is, platforms such as Facebook, LinkedIn, and Amazon will access this the same way that they're accessing their internal services through the same protocols and, um, and through the existing um, protocols, such as HTTPS, which is what is used and uh, adopted as company standards today. And there are many existing platforms working on these concepts and solutions, such as IPFS, storage.io, and Filecoin. These are what you can think of as the future, which is the decentralized drop boxes. There will be hundreds and thousands of computers owned by people like me, like you, and we run these systems. And 
I can store my digital identity on everyone's computer and it will be encrypted so then only those that have access and the rights to access it can access this information. And we already see this revolution starting as people like Tim Berners-Lee and those people from Princeton uh, who are working on concepts like block apps are already looking to build the next decentralized social media networks. So why is this solution good? Or why is it important? And why use a decentralized storage and not just, let's say, have everybody come up and build a new social media platform? Well, the issue is that existing social media platforms such as Facebook, and by the way, I don't hate Facebook, uh, just so you guys know. I just have to pick the biggest one as an example. So, the, they, they have monopolies over our um, digital identities. And as a result, this monopoly has stagnated innovation in this field. And one of the main reasons that it's hard to compete with Facebook and these platforms is that for a new entrant, apart from having to attract a large user base, which is by itself very difficult with products with network effects, it's also developed the technical infrastructure to manage and securely store users' digital identities. And this is something that is capital intensive and requires a lot of time. And if we're able to use a decentralized file system, such as storage IO or a, any sort of decentralized file system, platforms can, new platforms can simply plug in their system to this decentralized database and have access to this existing function and everything that they need to um, run a social media network similar to the way that they would if they were running their own databases. And as a result, this increases competition. And furthermore, if there are more social media platforms, more digital platforms, users will also have more choices. Because right now, you're locked into your social media platform because data is segregated in its, uh, by each platform. But in the future, if it's all stored in a centralized, uh, decentralized place, Switching platforms could be as easy as just clicking a button. And finally, it is important to note that there has been research which has shown that peer-to-peer that -peer networks for file streaming is actually 70% better for applications such as streaming. And I believe that this will be true for decentralized um, so, uh, databases as well. And of course, there are many challenges, such as the lack of infrastructure, which uh, for things such as databases are critical because Developers don't want to build new databases, they just want to build applications. And also, it's a challenge to educate users because this is not just a new technology, it's a new way of thinking about technology. It's a new paradigm shift, and I think that people need to take time to really understand what this really means. And finally, platforms need to adopt this, and this is something which is similar to educating users, you have to educate developers to understand why they should use decentralized file storages and not you know, work with Facebook or Twitter. And lastly, the biggest challenge, I believe, is redefining personal data. If you have everything stored on a decentralized file storage, what does this mean? How does this redefine digital data? Because not only is information taken away from the companies, but they're also taken away from you, because now they exist in this third party, in this space that doesn't belong to the companies, but it doesn't belong to you either. And this is the, where my current work is, is mainly in redefining digital identity under legal context through personhood. Similar to that of a company, you can have a company which is technically just a contract, but it has legal rights like a person. And I think this is important uh, uh, to legitimize the future of decentralized digital identities. And I think um, there's a lot of work to be done in this area. And also, I'm working on building tools, products, and platforms to support the decentralized ecosystem. 
so that one day, if I don't do it, other people can also build platforms and decentralized social media tools that could save the world or not. Um, I hope it does, but I could be wrong. Um, just like many people have been wrong. And so, you know, this is my email, and feel free to contact me if you have thoughts or want to work on something together. And, you know, I'm open to discussion. Thank you.